I'm turning my recording on. Father Stephen, it's my great pleasure to welcome you. Thank you very much for uh, visiting our uh, humble assembly. And um, welcome all of our listeners, just by the way of introduction, that starting some uh, month ago, just about at the beginning of the quarantine in March, um, uh, I started to offer uh, a series of educational lectures, which uh, were conducted with uh, varied success in the spring, but seemed to pick up here in the fall. And this Father Stevens' uh, address or talk is inauguration of our second fall session. And we have many interesting guest speakers after him uh, lined up. And I hope that all of you or whoever would like to would come and join our uh, conversations on Saturdays at 1 o'clock Eastern Time, 1 o'clock New York Time. All of the uh, sessions are going to be recorded and po posted on Facebook and YouTube. Um, uh, in absence of better uh, ch channel of communication, uh, announcements for the upcoming lectures and speakers are done via my personal Facebook page, uh, but probably we'll figure out to create a mailing list or something like that where an upcoming lectures are going to be announced uh, well in advance. But anyway, Father Stephen, who needs no introduction, you know, when I posted the famous Orthodox blogger, and you corrected to well known. It brought the memories of Father, uh, not Father, but Professor John Meyendorf, could always make corrections like that. He would cross a lot and put many, and then would cross many and put a lot. <laughs> Which, to me, to whom English is a second language, you know, such a correction was a complete loss, but nevertheless, I tried to comply. But nevertheless, I'm uh, giving, it's my great pleasure. Uh, to give a opportunity to speak to uh, a well-known and famous yeah. Father Stephen Freeman. And the um, uh, conversation today promises to be very interesting and engaging. If you do have questions, please send them in chat. So we'll give a chance to Father Stephen to finish first. And then, of course, we'll be open for questions and discussion. Thank you. Very good. Now, I think... Uh, Father Ilya, if I was famous, I would have more money. Uh, so I, I think I'm merely, merely well known. And, uh, you know, and many days I wish I wasn't as well known, uh, especially when I look at my email in basket. Uh, so, but uh, it's, it's a privilege to be here today. And I look, you know, the names that sort of show up uh, on the Zoom uh, chart in front of me. Uh, a number of more people I know, and it's it's good to to be with you on a Saturday. I told Father that I woke up this morning and it actually felt like a Saturday, uh, which is unusual because in retirement it seems like you wake up and you can't tell one day from another, uh, exactly. which gives you the danger that it could be that every day is a Monday, and uh, and that's not so good. But uh, it's good to be here. The topic uh, that Father uh, has asked me to speak about is the place of the intellectual life uh, in the Orthodox uh, faith. Um, it's something uh, uh, close to my heart, and, and I hope that uh, what I can say today will uh, uh, spur your own thoughts, and I'll be very interested in the conversation we can have coming out of this. But before everything and above everything, I want to begin the thoughts today by saying that the single goal of our life in Christ is the knowledge of God. The single goal of our life in Christ is the knowledge of God in the fullest possible sense of that. That, that is that we share in the very life of God as he gives himself to us in the God-man Jesus Christ that we might know him, as Jesus says uh, in John's gospel, that this is eternal life, that they might know him and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Um, so that's something that'll be useful for us just to sort of hang on as a touchstone to keep coming back as a central question is, is what I'm talking about something uh, that is important to the uh, reality of actually knowing God in the sense that Jesus uh, 
refers to it in John's gospel. So that'll be there. So the most obvious question is, what do we mean by the intellectual life? Uh, in a bit, it's a bit kind of misleading. The word intellectus uh, in Latin uh, was a word chosen to translate the Greek word noetic, that is having to do with the noose. Um, but it's changed its meaning. But if, for instance, if you're reading in, in say, Thomas Aquinas in scholastic writings in the Middle Ages, and it says intellect, you should substitute the word noose, because uh, that's what it's talking about. But over the centuries, particularly as the word is now evolved in English, uh, intellect would better, uh, or intellectual would better be translated uh, as rational because it's not referring to noetic activity, but to the activity of the rational mind, that is the, the logikos mind, um, that uh, reasoning uh, faculty that, that we have. So we use our rational uh, faculty, for instance, uh, to uh, think about things, to examine things, to weigh things, uh, to consider various things related to our Orthodox Christian faith. That's a kind of knowing. Um, there's also the other form of knowing that which is described uh, in probably best today uh, by the word noetic, although if you say that to the general, uh, I mean, if you, if you drop that word in the sermon, most of the congregation will not know what you're talking about. So you have to stop and, you know, and explain it. I have to explain it, remind readers if I use it on the blog, but we don't have another word in English. Um, Closest thing you could possibly say to noetic would be spiritual knowledge, but I prefer going ahead and using the word noetic. Uh, in this activity of the noose, the noose is that faculty of the soul by which we perceive God and by which we're able to perceive certain things also about the world itself. Perception is not the same thing as thinking. Um, and it's important for us to make a distinction about these two things. Um, rational activity is the sort of thing you're engaged in when you go to pick berries or mushrooms. You need your logos, you need your, your reasoning uh, faculty. You, you see, measure, weigh, compare. Uh, you ask, are these berries ripe? Uh, uh, is this mushroom safe? I threw the mushroom thing in for Russian readers. I don't know any Americans who gather mushrooms, but I get the impression that it's something Russians do as frequently as hobbits. But uh, so I don't know, maybe I spend too much time reading Dostoevsky. They gather some mushrooms and then kill somebody with an ax. But um, anyway, but you, you use your rational mind uh, for picking berries or you go into, uh, you know, a grocery store and you're shopping. That is a rational activity and you have to use it. If you don't, you come out with the wrong things. Uh, or if you were picking mushrooms in a noetic fashion, do not invite me to supper. Um, you will very likely come home with poisonous mushrooms. The noetic faculty uh, is not given to us uh, for perceiving uh, the poisonous status of a mushroom. Uh, that's a rational activity. And you have to have both. Just like there's other kinds of faculties we have. You need to smell something. You need to taste something. You need to hear something. We think about in an intellectual that is rational matter, and we also perceive noetically. Um, so it's important in making those distinctions. A good reason for making this distinction is to remind ourselves that both of these faculties, the noose and the intellect or reason, are given to us by God and are necessary for our life and for our well-being. We need both. The orthodox understanding of the Christian life includes the whole of our being, uh, not just some segment, but the whole of our being and everything God has given us. At the same time, none of our faculties is meant to exist in isolation. We need them all. Uh, Evagrius of Ponticus, uh, whose uh, writings oftentimes get tagged under names of saints uh, because Evagrius apparently was a bit of an originist 
and was condemned, but almost all of his writings have come down to us under headings like St. Nihilus and some others, uh, but he gets quoted. But he famously said, a theologian is one who prays, and one who prays is a theologian. And I hear in that not the exclusion of everything other than prayer. And I don't hear him saying, all you need to do to be a theologian is pray. I don't hear him saying that. Uh, the recognition is, is that when you've done everything else, prayer still remains essential. Our noetic perception, which is should and rightly is part of our, our prayer life, uh, is required to bring all things into their proper place. Uh, in the understanding of the fathers, the noetic faculty should be the ruling faculty, that which governs everything and brings everything uh, into the whole. Um, so uh, when I think of a theologian, um, I, I actually once made a Russian joke. It's the only Russian joke I've ever come up with. The, if, I'm, if I'm right, the Russian word for theologian is uh, bogoslov. Uh, literally the translation, the, the God word, the Bogoslov. I told someone I'm not a theologian, I'm a Blogoslov. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, or as a friend of mine says, I'm not a theologian, I'm a blogger. Um, <laughs> the, uh, to, to be a theologian, and, and I've got one acquaintance who stubbornly says that there's only uh, two or three people the, ch the church has ever applied the title theologian to uh, St. John, uh, the theologian, uh, St. Uh, Simeon, the new theologian, and therefore there's only two or three theologians. And I just, that's a silly thing. What was St. Evagory is talking about? Uh, his statement would have no meaning if there were only two of them who ever existed. Um, a theologian, in fact, I would say, uh, a, a problem, and we'll touch on this, one of the problems with the intellectual life is that not enough intellectuals in the church are theologians. Uh, you can be simply an academic intellectual, but not a theologian. A theologian must be one who prays, and, and that is, there's, there's a whole life meant in that, and we'll uh, hopefully dig down into that uh, and look at it, and that and that this is the 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 high goal uh, that we have in orthodoxy is uh, to to have theologians in our midst. Very important, but that doesn't exist without the intellect. This whole discussion that we're doing today uh, would not have been necessary or newsworthy to most of the early fathers. Some of them, like St. Justin the Apologist in the second century, were intellectuals before they were Christians. Uh, and they then Christianized their intellectual life. Uh, St. Justin was a pagan philosopher who becomes a Christian, and he used his philosophy in one of the first great treatises which he wrote and sent to the emperor as a defense of Christianity. And he used everything he knew as a philosopher uh, if you will, under uh, what he now knew as a theologian uh, to present uh, the Christian faith and to, de and to defend Christians uh, and suggest why the emperor should perhaps stop killing us. Um, but he also was one of the earliest writers uh, to give us uh, some, some very helpful leads uh, theologically, a saint of the church. Uh, saint Basil the Great, St. Gregory the Theologian, his dear friend, both of them studied together at the same time uh, at the finest institutions of their day, first in Alexandria, then in Athens, and they studied the finest uh, that was available in pagan philosophy. You know, moderns don't understand, philosophy was pretty much, which meant the love of wisdom, meant the study of everything. A philosopher was expected to know everything. Uh, math would have been part of philosophy. Uh, what they did for physics would have been part of philosophy. Geometry, mathematics, all of that would have been philosophy uh, and have gone under that single heading. They studied all of that uh, at Alexandria. There were Christian teachers by that time in Alexandria, but they've studied under them all. 
Um, and um, it, it continued that as well uh, in, uh, in Athens. Uh, also, they had come under the influence uh, from, oh, it's a prior Gregory there in Cappadocia, who had been a student of Origen. And though people like to attack Origen, it's probably accurately described as the Augustan of the East, um, as in his influence cleaned up and fixed, but the influence of Origen on the major intellectual and theological teachers of the Eastern Church from the Cappadocians forward uh, is, uh, is immeasurable. Uh, he's, he was just that important. So they're sort of a generation removed from him, but influenced by him nonetheless. Um, and he certainly would have held his own among any of, of the pagans around him. Um, uh, when Origen walked around, he's said to have had six secretaries or amanuenses uh, following with him, writing down everything he said. The guy was a dictation machine. Um, we only have a fraction of what he said, uh, but apparently they hung on his every word and tried to write it down. Um, but uh, you can add to that number uh, later example, St. Gregory Palamas, who when he was, he grew up in the court of the emperor in Constantinople. When he was seven years old, his father died uh, and the emperor uh, took care of him, saw to that he was raised, continued in the, the imperial court, uh, that he was educated with the best uh, education, which would have included everything that uh, Basil and Gregory would have studied, uh, including, uh, we know for a fact that he studied Aristotle, uh, you know, in various philosophical things. Uh, St. Gregory, at one point, as after he had gone to Mount Athos, um, was traveling to come to Constantinople to deal with a controversy and was uh, waylaid by essentially Turkish pirates and carried off in captivity to be held for ransom. And while he was there uh, under the Turks, he engaged in a court debate with their theologians uh, or philosophers. Uh, and he held his own. Uh, and he held his own because they too had been reading Aristotle. They too had read the Greek philosophers. He was educated in that. He's not simply some, you know, he's he, you know, some peasant from the backwaters. He knew he was well-trained in all of that and held his own. So, uh, and we could go on and on with the list. It is simply uh, the fact that, that the example in orthodoxy is not of uh, simply holy men and women who uh, pray and have some sort of pipeline from God and receive their knowledge and share it out with the rest of us and don't need to read books. Um, the orthodoxy, uh, the fullness of orthodoxy has created civilizations. Uh, everything that we know, for instance, about the pagan world, the ancient pagan non-Christian world, including their attacks on Christianity. Everything we know about that, we know because a Christian monk copied it down. Every book, you know, lasting manuscript that we have of things like the writings of Caesar or Cicero or Plato or Aristotle, all of those, there's not really a manuscript that predates about the 10th century, which is meaning it's already a Christian manuscript and it exists because some monk by candlelight or oil lamp sat in cramped quarters, cold or whatever, copying down uh, pagan writings because just as they were copying down the scriptures and the lectionaries and the theological writings, they wrote this down too. Why? Because it needed to be known. That's how much it was valued, that a monk's precious time that could have been copying just Christian writings, uh, his time was considered so valuable because these writings were con considered valuable. And those who think those writings are not considered valuable insult the lives of the monks who copied them and made it possible for us to have them. 
This is the truth of orthodoxy, this fullness that is a fullness of civilization. It does us no good to sit around and weep about the loss of Hagia Sophia, you know, uh, or dream about Holy Mother Russia if we don't want to live the Byzantine life uh, or the fullness of the life uh, that was envisioned at the court of the czars uh, in terms of having a full intellectual life uh, that was integrated into the life of the church, that we should in fact be teachers of the world. This is, this is the fullness of an orthodox vision. The, uh, it's also important though to say, uh, to say a few things about the history though of, of orthodox intellectual uh, life in the modern period. The conquering of the Byzantine Empire uh, under the Turks and others uh, had a tendency over time to suppress the ability of the church to teach. Uh, just as today, Turkey does not allow a seminary to be open, uh, a halki uh, to be open in Turkey. Uh, so they, for years, suppressed the ability to teach. So oftentimes, uh, during a lot of periods uh, under the Turks, especially in the modern period, if you wanted an education, you had to leave uh, the Ottoman Empire and go to Europe and study oftentimes in Switzerland or Germany uh, or up into Ukraine and study in Kiev. Uh, starting with Peter the Great and others, there was a reform uh, in uh, Russian uh, Christian education. There had been very little, all too little. And, uh, but a lot of it was still bringing in uh, resources from Western powers, either Protestant or Catholic. Uh, if anyone's familiar with the work of St. Peter Mahila uh, in Kiev, it has a very Catholic flavor. There's a lot of Russian uh, work of the uh, 17th, 18th, 19th century that has a very Catholic flavor to it because they're drawing from what's available. They're trying to fix it and bring it in line with orthodoxy, uh, but still it it has that kind of flavor about it. I mean, in the 19th century, Latin was the language for teaching theology, even in Russia, because that was the intellectual language of Western Europe, and Western Europe was considered sort of the dominant place. Um, the, they're really, people had, most people don't realize what happened uh, in uh, the 20th century in orthodox intellectual life. It is hands down the most important century uh, in, in uh, orthodoxy uh, of any of the last three or four that went before that. And a lot of that has to do with things that began in Russia, uh, some of them under the Slavophiles, uh, Kiryevsky and uh, Komyakov and others, um, and uh, particularly the Russian uh, immigrants uh, intellectuals like uh, George Swarovski, uh, Bulgakov and others, uh, uh, Vladimir Lasky, who were exiled uh, from Russia under the Bolsheviks and wind up ultimately centered in Paris. Um, Swarovski, uh, I think, is the single most important figure in all of that, in that, I mean, it, it, and I'd recommend to anyone, if, if you uh, have sleepless nights, uh, to read his ways of Russian thought. Um, it is a couple of massive volumes that traces through the history of, of uh, sort of theological education and philosophy in, uh, in Russia. Um, but he does a very good job of sort of demonstrating just how bad things had gotten in the Orthodox world uh, and how it begins to revive. He does not have a chapter explaining how important he is in the present time, but his work in what he called a neo-patristic synthesis, that is that we need to go back to the fathers. It is probably accurate to say that in orthodox institutions across the world today, whether, I, I, I'm not as familiar with what's going on in Russia, I know more about Romania, uh, Greece, and other things, but that pretty much what's going on today uh, in one way or another, uh, has to look to Florovsky uh, for how it thinks. Uh, now, there's lots of debates under that umbrella. Uh, 
but I mean, there were figures like uh, John Ramanidis, uh, who was a student of Florovsky. Um, uh, John Zazulis was a student of Florovsky, uh, but there's many, many others as well, all of whom uh, looking to the fathers and Florovsky looking to talk about what he called the mind of the fathers, the phronema, so that we're not just looking at collecting quotes, but trying to understand how did they actually see and know what they knew and, and bringing that together. Um, I think uh, a, a deeply neglected figure uh, in, uh, would be uh, uh, Father uh, Dmitri Stanilawi uh, in Romania. He translated the whole of St. Maximus writings into Romanian, 20 um, some odd volumes of theology. I mean, he's an amazingly productive man, uh, but also thoroughly familiar uh, with Western intellectuals, uh, both among Catholics and Protestants. And when you read uh, his work, he, they are footnoted uh, just as the fathers are. He's bringing orthodoxy uh, into dialogue with everything that's going on. So there's, there's been a tremendous revival in orthodox work and thought. Um, right now, there's, there's even a fair amount of debate going on about the, the so-called neopatristic synthesis what was working about it, what was weak about it. And it's a debate, which is also part of the intellectual life. Um, but having said that, I just will say for a minute a little bit about what happened in the West with the intellectual life in the last two centuries, because this is important. Um, there was sort of, as the, the modernity is beginning and the power of science and of a rationality to invent and understand and probe things goes on, you start getting um, notions in Western thought. They will talk about the science of historical, critical, biblical studies, not just studying the scriptures, but the science of it. A notion that if the same principles were used to study the Bible, that we used to study gravity or other things like that, then we'll come out with, you know, a, a proper and right understanding. You had uh, certain ones like uh, Protestants in America uh, coming out of uh, the Second Great Awakening. You had the uh, Restoration Movement in which they said all you needed was the Bible and reason and everybody would agree. I think, well, one of them's missing then because uh, uh, that movement produced three major denominations, <laughs> the same movement. So it is, um, but with that, there's a movement that sort of began in an eroding in which uh, professional uh, intellectual work in theology and scriptural studies becomes more and more divorced from the church itself and from the teaching and life of the church. All of the major universities in America that are, you know, the dominant famous ones, Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth, Princeton, all, all of those universities were church universities. They were founded by churches, by Christians, for a Christian purpose. None of them are Christian today. When I was interviewing at Duke back in the late 80s uh, to, to enter the doctoral program, I was meeting with uh, uh, Jeffrey Wainwright, wonderful Methodist scholar, tremendous uh, fellow, a great friend of the Orthodox, uh, actually did a, a commencement address uh, at St. Vladimir's, was awarded an honorary doctorate at St. Vladimir's. But I remember talking to Jeffrey and he said, where all are you applying? And, you know, I mentioned some schools and I mentioned Harvard and his eyebrows went up and he said to me, there's no need to apply to Harvard. And I thought, well, am I just not that good? And he said, there's no one there who believes in God. You won't be happy there. <laughs> and he wasn't joking. I mean, in a doctoral program in religion, there's no one there who believes in God. I don't know if they've hired someone since that believes in God, but he was not lying in the late 80s when he said it. Um, I mean, he didn't mention that Duke had plenty of their own who didn't believe in God. I, I recall asking him uh, very pointedly, uh, I think I was 30, 35 at the time I was entering there. I said to him, can you get me through the program here without me having to take any courses from a Marxist or a feminist. I told him, I said, I'm too old to put up with that nonsense. 
And he paused for a minute, sort of looked up, scratched his head, and he said, yes, I think I can. But he knew it was going to be tricky. But I just didn't want to put up with it because they were Nazis. Uh, I mean, people you can't disagree with. I don't mind, ne never minded studying with anybody you could argue with. That's healthy. But he didn't want to study with anyone uh, that I could not argue with. For instance, there was a Catholic uh, theologian at uh, Duke who did wonderful work on iconography, and I wanted to study with her, but she had a requirement in her class. Uh, she was a feminist and would not allow a paper that did not use inclusive language with regard to God. And I thought, sorry, dear, I don't write heresy for anybody. Um, that's not my goal. I, I, I cannot say uh, use that language with regard to God. So I never studied under it. God bless her. Um, but, you know, I could read her, but I, I just didn't want to put up with someone uh, who was that intolerant. Um, oddly enough, in the name of tolerance, they were intolerant. Well, this, this kind of action in uh, American institutions in which being a believer and trying to do studies as a believer could be met with hostility um, could breed a lot of, of uh, people to become anti-intellectual and in a sense blame it on mere intellectuality. Well, it's just an abuse of, of the intellectual life uh, to turn it into an argument against God. Um, and, and that's, in a way, that's nothing more than the politics of institutions. It has nothing to do with the intellectual life. It's just the politics of American and many European institutions. Um, you know, uh, it's not solid out there, but you have to pick. You know, someone says to me, I want to do graduate studies, where should I go? Well, you start doing some consulting. Um, you always want to go and study with someone that you want to learn what they know. Uh, that's the key to studying. You, it's, you want to learn what they know. Uh, you want to allow them to have some of that in your life. You don't want to spend all of your time. My time in seminary, uh, a good mainline Episcopal seminary, I spent as much time arguing for just basic doctrine as I did trying to learn things. Um, and, um, I, 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 you know, I did sharpen, you know, my pencil a bit with that, but it's still, you know, uh, my seminary should not have been, had, had to waste time. Um, you know, I remember a professor, we were translating St. Ignatius of Antioch together, and, and he was a priest, Anglican priest, and St. Ignatius in the treatise says, in his, one of his letters, refers to the Eucharist as the body and blood of God. And the professor just choked on it. I said, what's the matter? He said, I can't say Jesus is God. I said, dude, what about very God of very God in the creed? He said, oh, I cross my fingers when we come to that point in the mass. Said, okay, Arians. Uh, you know, he was a priest. Um, I remember he also was extremely Anglo-Catholic, and he was more fa he was as fastidious about the crumbs as any Orthodox or Catholic priest would ever be at the mass. And I remember thinking to him, saying to him, "Why are you so fastidious about the crumbs? If Jesus isn't God, there just is just bread. You know what's the deal?" I can under and I think he just had OCD or something. He just was fastidious, uh, but uh, not really a believer. But you know, there it was in seminary. Uh, I took very few courses with him because I didn't want to put up with it. You know, I don't have to argue for Jesus being God or watch him, you know. So so that's that's something that's out there today and influences people. Uh, many of us who are converts come from churches uh, in which the intellectual life has been um, a, a sort of whip with which to beat people. Uh, every time I see someone, including in orthodox circles, use the word fundamentalist, uh, I have to admit that uh, alarm bells go off for me. First off, don't use the term to beat people with. Be more specific. 
uh, do not file people under a general heading of fundamentalists. For one, I grew up in Greenville, South Carolina and the shadow of Bob Jones University. I know what a real fundamentalist is, you know, and uh, for a lot of people, fundamentalist just means anybody who believes a little bit more of the Bible than they do. Uh, and, and that's an insufficient definition. Uh, there are fundamentalists, and I've met, met them even in orthodoxy, um, but uh, that's, you know, it, it's too easy to throw words like that around. We need to have better conversations than that. But I'm sympathetic on the one hand when people feel intimidated or nervous around uh, intellectual things because they don't trust them. Um, and uh, we live at a time in, when, in which the institutions of our culture, academic, political, and otherwise, are at the lowest trust level in history. Just because someone has credentials doesn't impress us, doesn't impress us. And I have to say, as we've gone through this terrible, has been going through this terrible time of pandemic, we discover on Facebook that just because you're a medical doctor doesn't mean that nine other medical doctors won't disagree with you. You know, it's like, you cannot say, well, science now knows. Well, science now argues is more like it. There's an argument, but argument is part of in the intellectual life. So, you know, I think maybe to bring this back under a heading that the intellectual life is a tool the study, like for instance, when I, I get this, when people come at me with something on my blog and, and I'll get a, uh, a long list of quotes from the fathers refuting a point I just made in an article. You know, and there'll be 20 quotes. And I'll think to myself, I know you did not go to your bookshelf and pull down the volumes of the fathers, look those up and type them out yourself. You Googled, you know, a penal substitutionary atonement in the fathers got some sort of website and you've cut and paste and posted it and think you just won the argument. Never having read any of the fathers you just quoted, never having studied them in context, never having, you know, not even knowing Greek or whatever, but you just throw it out there. That's not, um, that's not intellectual work, that's cut and paste. Uh, and there's a lot of people who think cut and paste uh, from lists like that. Uh, that's, you know, it, even Florovsky and others talked about this abuse of patristic writings. Um, I, you know, if I want to know what a father said, and this is the noetic part, I don't just want to know what he said so that I can quote him. I want to know what he knew so that he could say it. What did he know? I, one of the things I've written a great deal about, in fact, I'm working on an article with it right now, is the use of typology in the fathers, that you use the images from the Old Testament, you know, for, we've just gone through this with this, with the Feast of the Cross, you know, you see the cross and this, the cross and that, the cross and this, and all of these types and foreshadowings. Um, well, I, I, I long ago asked the question, if if this is not just a literary technique, and I don't think it is, if this is not a literary technique, but for instance, um, when Moses spreads his arms out in the battle against the Amalekites, that the cross is actually there. The cross, the lamb is slain before the foundations of the earth, the cross is actually present in the actions of Moses, which I believe it is. What does that say about the world? What must the world be like if these things can actually be there? And when I write about the interpretation of scripture, trying to follow the fathers, that's part of what, you know, that I'm trying to write and draw people into is you need to have your mind, your phronema changed. You see the world in flat secular terms. You need to see it uh, in the fullness of the spiritual terms the fathers. Had. And that's for me, that's both an intellectual activity. I want to see what they actually said. That means my, my intellect to collect, to study that, uh, to read the arguments about it, to see the background of what they're saying. Uh, the whole of that, the, the whole context that they're writing in, uh, but then also to, to try to pierce through to the mystery 
that they perceived, which is a noetic activity. And if you will, it's in the union of those two uh, that to me, uh, theology is forged uh, and done. And so, uh, you know, which is why in a seminary, if you go to one of the church's seminaries, you'll spend about as much time in the chapel as you do in the classroom. You know, you have the classroom, you have the library, you study these things, and then you go pray. Then you go pray. I can think of, I mean, I had read for tw Orthodox writings for 20 years before I became Orthodox. It's a lot of reading. Uh, I had done my work at Duke. I wrote my thesis at Duke on the theology of icons. It was still an, I was still an Anglican. Uh, when I finished that, I realized I need to be Orthodox. This is just, I can't do, live without doing this. But I was receiving the church in 98 and ordained uh, to the priesthood in 99. But over the years, to this day, uh, standing in a liturgy, the choir will be singing something and suddenly, suddenly, you know, a coin will drop, uh, a light bulb will come on, and something that I've read and seen for 40 years now, I understand it. I perceive the truth of it. And I wouldn't have perceived the truth of it if I hadn't been in the church that day. It takes both. It takes both. Uh, we need to be about, and I mean, the world's crumbling, and who knows, it's all going to go to heck in a handbasket. Uh, very soon, probably. But this is not the first time we've done this as Orthodox. We've watched so many empires fall. You know, it's just, uh, this is just the latest iteration of something we've seen many times. We should learn that, we should remember that once upon a time we were good at this. Uh, so we need to be good about it now. We need to be nurturing, teaching our children. Uh, it's going to be hard because it is a hostile culture here. Uh, to our pursuit of these things. But we need to nurture orthodoxy and our children and our members. That is the whole of orthodoxy. Um, I, I will say, I, I'm kind of closing here, uh, part of the democracy of the modern world, and that's, democracy has got so many myths about it that aren't true. Um, but one of those is that everybody thinks he's an expert on everything. Someone commented today uh, with the death of Ruth Ginsburg that they'd never seen so many constitutional scholars, you know, that are there. And they're all got their opinions and they're writing it. Everybody's an epidemiologist when it comes to the pandemic. Uh, everybody's a theologian if it comes to anything. Everybody knows everything. Just ask them. Uh, and it, it is, it makes it, I, I, I've written several articles over the years that ask, can uh, can a, a, a democratic, by the, in the little d sense of the word, as we all are in our modern world, can a democratic soul be saved? Partly because you have to get saved in a kingdom. And too many of us don't want to have a king. Too many of us don't want to have a bishop. You know? Um, someone asked me, what do you do about thus and such during these pandemic times? I just told them, I do what my bishop tells me. I don't have to even think about it. I'm a priest. I live in obedience. I'm a married priest. I obey my wife. I check with the bishop, check with my wife, and I'm pretty well good to go. But you know, maybe my, my godmother, if it's really difficult. But nonetheless, I mean, nurturing this in ourselves so that we're, I mean, I've been rebuked and called a heretic by a guy whose chrism wasn't even dry yet. And he had a list of fathers quoting when he did it. And I think, good golly, man, I'm an archpriest. At least say that respectfully. Uh, you know, and I've gotten, you know, I've gotten replies that say, oh, I can't stand it when people throw around their authority like that. I'm thinking, welcome to orthodoxy. Welcome to orthodoxy. And I would even say, you're a young man. Be careful how you speak to the old. Uh, this, this is something people should understand, who we are. Do not say you love tradition and then act in an untraditional manner. You know, we need to, to do the real deal. So those are sort of my remarks on this. Let's open up for questions, Father Ilya.
and hopefully I haven't uh, uh, beaten the horse out of all recognition. So he is dead. Well, uh, Father, I have many, many questions, but here is not an interview. It's a, a platform precisely for an open engagement. And I want to thank you for uh, speaking to us and taking some of the questions. Uh, some of it comes back to our conversation that we had before. Um, what I find uh, that's very, very puzzling and challenging is that even among uh, our fellow clergy and among our parishioners and everything else, uh, various, uh, if not abstract, but then political subjects cause much more interest than actual any intellectual pursuit of the matters of faith. Yeah. You know, you go on uh, Facebook clergy group and if you post something about guns, you'll get 200 responses within the first 30 minutes. You post something on the earliest icon of the Theotokos and maybe you go, you'll get two clicks. Yep. Right? Um, or, or, or find some ancient manuscript or or... I don't know, various matter of history, theology, or what have you. So we seemed not to bring Christ to the society, but we embed society in our personal intellectual preferences and political opinions into the church and pass it for orthodoxy or mere Christianity at this point. So I think, yeah, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it's cultural difference, maybe it's something else, but why is there a fear of intellectual engagement of things that are most needful or should be of the greatest interest at the complete dismissal of the notion of there is something there uh, under the guises of dismissing an empty intellectualism and doesn't accomplish anything. Yeah. So maybe I'm, I'm not formulating my question very precisely, but it's just I'm thinking the subject of, uh, of it a little bit worse than too vague and encompass too many things. But this would shock me as a, a I joined the church as a young man and about the same time as you did, although of course I'm much younger than you are. And I remember coming to the seminary how there was thirst among young people to to seek this. We were, we were like sponges, you know, trying to get hold of everything because it simply wasn't available at all. And here when we have at our fingertips the uh, we have it all basically. You encountering phrases like, well, of course I'm not as educated as intellectual as you are, but <laughs> well, what prevents you from being quite as intellectual? And if you're saying, but why won't you engage in the same grounds instead of just being dismissive of me under the guise of under the, what you could consider piety, but in a sense is false piety. Yeah. I Thank think you. there's, yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes there's a real uh, defense mechanism that uh, people feel inadequately trained intellectually or that uh, they're uh, not on as solid a ground as possible. The other thing is, is that we, we in this culture, we marinate. I mean, I write a great deal and critically of the, uh, what is termed uh, modernity. People ask me, uh, why do you hammer about that? I'd say, well, it actually for the last 100 years, uh, in academic circles, modernity has been a hot topic. Uh, I'm not doing something unique as an Orthodox Christian. I'm just uh, adding my voice into a larger intellectual question about an intellectual concept called modernity. Not the period of time, not technology, not medicine, but a way of seeing the world. Democracy is part, uh, the ideas of democracy are part of modernity. Um, but uh, one of them is the idea that, uh, a critical idea that it is our task to make the world a better place. I get all kinds of pushback when I write and saying, you're not going to make the world a better place. Uh, I'm not the first one who said that. You can find it in Chesterton. Uh, I first encountered it uh, studying under Stanley Hauerwas at Duke, uh, but I think they're right. We do not make the world a better place. I would even settle for us just trying to make it a, a halfway decent place, but you know, much less the better thing. Uh, that's a philosophy called utilitarianism. Uh, the greatest good for the greatest number. Uh, the Among the slogans of the Bolsheviks uh, was a better world. Uh, and in the name of a better world, you can kill millions and millions of people and it's done over and over again. But we get caught up in this in that we think politics, like the democratic process 
is the primary tool by which we will make the world a better place. Well, it just doesn't. It, 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 it never does, and it never will. Um, it's a confused mess. Uh, and in fact, you know, it's like this year, I've been trying to get me a, a bumper sticker, I mean, a, or a, a yard sign with a quote from Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead, it's my generation, in which he said, the lesser of two evils is still evil. And, you know, it's, um, you do not make the world a better place by voting evil in again and again, even if it's just a lesser evil, it's still evil. It's about money. It's about power. Modernity with technology really takes off in the early 19th century, primarily in Scotland and then down to England and elsewhere, when technology and innovation was married to profit. It became the greatest motive uh, of all time that we could improve things and sell stuff. And you add to that the 20th century with consumerism, but everybody's an expert. And so when these questions come up, Father, including among our clergy, we really think that these political ideas are important. I think they are not. Um, they are interesting, perhaps, but they're not important. Um, the, certainly, whatever it is, the importance they might have, it is not germane to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not something we can bring on earth. That's heresy. The kingdom of God is from God. It comes. It not only comes, there's not a darn thing you can do to keep it from coming. Jesus says, if I, by the finger of God, cast out devils, then the kingdom of God has come near you. And the, the kingdom of God is incarnate on the altar, uh, and, and, and on and on, and, and the believing Christian life. This is the life of the kingdom of God, and they can't keep it from happening. Uh, the, all of the works, whether it was Soviet, American, or anything else, they cannot stop it. Um, and those who think that the church needs to achieve some kind of voice by which we can influence the political world have been co-opted. They've been co-opted by the modern vision into thinking that that is the means. I mean, if that's how you think you, that we, the church needs to influence the world, you need to be something other than orthodox because orthodoxy is not even a flea on the butt of an elephant in America and it never will be very likely. Uh, you want to influence what goes on up there, you need to be a Baptist, maybe a Catholic. Uh, they got more votes than we do. We don't matter. I mean, we can't even get them to, to spank the Turks. Uh, nothing. So I, I uh, you know, but this, this mind, you know, I, I, I think it's like, I want to say to people, for heaven's sakes, give up this, give up these political things. And if you vote, vote once, vote once, quit voting a thousand times a day uh, and, and occupying your, your mind and your life with these concerns. This is, you know, politics, politics is to the civic life what pornography is to marriage, okay? There's people, my father-in-law was one of the finest Christians I've ever known. He was a Baptist. That man went to every city council meeting in his town for years. He went in his city. Most people have never been to a city council meeting and yet they have political opinions. Most people have never been to a precinct meeting of a party and yet they have political opinions. That is, most people just have opinions and they don't even matter except when you vote. Go vote once. If you care about politics, go to your city council, go to these meetings, get involved. Do something. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, when he lived in uh, Vermont, used to like to attend the local town meetings. They were like the Zimtsvo that, that once upon a time in Russia. He just loved it. He thought it was wonderful. He liked to see that kind of democracy in action, but I don't think he would have wasted any time with the other. So I, you know, and that's to say, Father Ilya, that we need to keep sounding this note, um, you know, to sound this note uh, about the truth of how we do things and need to be about these things. But on the other hand, uh, the culture, 
we speak into a culture and the culture is so powerful and permeates everything. Uh, so, you know, I, you know, I just want to sometimes just say to my brother priest, don't worry about this stuff. Stop it. Don't waste your time. You know, quit this. Talk about other things. You know, tell me about what's going on with you and Jesus. And this is not just piety. Tell me about something that matters. Um, you know, uh, I, I can promise you not much will be different no matter who they elect in November. I mean, little things, but not much. Uh, yeah, well, uh, when I was asking, I was not asking necessarily in particular about this year, but just in general. That worldly topic seems to preoccupy us was much more than something that deals with the way of the church. I mean, of course, the better great instance is a subject, a hot topic of this conversation, but is it really about the church? Yeah. Well, anyway, well, questions starting to come up. Uh, you often speak about perceiving the world noetically and the kingdom of God being revealed sacramentally. Is there a work that we must do to make this perception, or is it purely the work of God? Well, I think on the one hand, um, the the path of first off that the fathers would talk about purification. Uh, I mean, you have a noose, but you may not be aware of your noose. For instance, one of the reasons you're not aware of your noose is it's too noisy inside you, uh, and the noise inside us is mostly the passions. I mean, for instance, almost all advertising and and politics, by the way. Almost all advertising and politics that permeates our world is uh, designed to engage your passions, to make you feel, and to react. It is, does, it is not designed to actually make you think. It doesn't even appeal to the intellect, but it's the passions. So you feel the anger, you feel the shame, you feel the greed, you feel these, these various things that stir up in you, you, you know, and then you go pray about it, and you're all torn up inside. Well, you're not going to get, you, you may get an answer, but you're not going to hear it. Uh, the noose is, uh, the, the passions need to be quietened down a bit. Uh, that's why we pray, we fast. Um, you know, how, how do I battle with the passions? I mean, I, I've written a great deal about shame, which is one of the master emotions uh, and needs to be dealt with so that we can uh, learn to, to see our face clearly uh, within our heart, to see the face of Christ clearly in our heart. Uh, this, is, this is a slow work. Uh, it's not easy. But, you know, when, when the church teaches about hesychasm, what does it mean? Hesychia is, is, is silence, quiet, a listening quiet. And um, the noisiness of my passion, uh, you know, impassioned brain, learning to get quiet. So, you know, it's, it is... Um, you know, the term in Greek for passionlessness is apatheia. Uh, our English word apathy comes from it, but our apathy sounds like a bad thing. Sometimes I do tell people, though, you might just need to quit caring about this stuff so much if it's eating you up. And it is eating you up. Um, you know, it is... Um, uh, I remember uh, as an Anglican monk in the 70s, I was talking with him. And he said back during the 60s, uh, in the early 70s, he would have young people showing up at the monastery so angry about peace. <laughs> they had no peace, but they were angry about peace as the Vietnam War was raging. You know, and it was like he said that the contemplative, that is the person of prayer, needs to go no further than his own heart to find the source of all violence in the world. And if, if, for instance, I mean, I'm going to be speaking next month uh, at the uh, St. Moses, uh, the Black Brotherhood on the topic of racism and shame. And I would say, if you can't deal with the racism that's in your heart, and most people don't even recognize the racism that's in their heart, but if you don't deal with it there, it, won't, it will not be dealt with in our culture. No matter what laws get passed in the next year or so in response to the present uh, kind of stirred up stuff, uh, it will not change hearts. It will take, it's a lot longer, slower work. Hearts do change. I saw it. I grew up in the Jim Crow South. Hearts change. Uh, things are much different than they were, but they still have a long way to go. And uh, it, that's long, slow, uh, patient work. 
Uh, so that would, I would say, in terms of this uh, acquiring noetic perception, it's slow work. I, you know, I would, I read about this for years, and I just, I wasn't certain what it was. Uh, and it, I, there's some things, a few things I read that did help me. Uh, I think the, the little book by uh, Archimandrite Meletius Weber, uh, Bread, Wine, Oil, Water, whatever, but that little title. I found that actually to be one of the more helpful books uh, in talking about these things. Oftentimes, if you read the Fathers, it can be so uh, caught up in patristic jargon, you know, terminology, that you just don't connect to it. Um, that's a lot of what I try to do when I'm writing on my blog, is to take those terms and translate them uh, into a, a more accessible English uh, so that you can get at understanding these things. But even then, it's not easy, um, you know, uh, learning to do it. I could sit down with someone, for instance, in a confessional setting over a couple of months as I got to know them, and perhaps in your sharing and all like that, begin to point out, ah, that was a noetic perception. That really helps when you actually can see that this experience was a noetic perception. You think, oh, it's like that. Okay, I do have that occasionally. And so how do I quieten so I can begin to have that more often? How do I make that part of my life of prayer? Um, stillness, quiet, the Jesus prayer can be very important about it. Um, just quit worrying about anything. The, the, the noose is about right now, this moment, right now. Um, and um, there's a lot of things that the, are questions that the noose isn't even interested in. And uh, so anyhow, another kind of question or something, Father, thought or reaction? Uh, uh, please, you know, I would welcome our guests if you like to uh, send a question in or just unmute yourself and ask Father Stephen use the opportunity for dialogue. Don't be shy. I have a question. Um, I am a recent convert to Orthodoxy. I was baptized back in January. Um, and I do have a background in education. Um, I have my PhD in that, I love to read. But I confess I worry about I think I tend the maybe the opposite direction where I find myself, you know, I think I'd rather read and study than pray. Um, could Father Stephen say a few words just about how do we how do we balance um, inquiry with you know living um, the Orthodox life? If that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's going to differ from person to person. I once read the advice of a monastic who said you shouldn't read more a day than you pray, and I'm thinking, well, there goes both of them for me. <laughs> Um, the, I mean, it's important to have a prayer life. I would even say one way that we increase that is talk to God, uh, always, all the time, uh, chat with him. It doesn't just have to be formal time in front of the icons, talk with him, um, and, you know, make that a common thing. Uh, in other words, part of what's going on with that is, is, is practicing, practicing communion with God. Um, the, the icon time is good time, um, you know, and important. It has its place. Uh, but just chat time is very, very important as well. And uh, I, Father Roman Braga, who uh, maybe probably was a saint, he suffered terribly, terribly under uh, Ceausescu in Romania, along with uh, others. Uh, but he said it was in solitary confinement that he learned to pray. I mean, and he's one of those who would say, I bless my prison, which is a horrible thing if you read about, if you ever read about the details. The prison he was in, Solzhenitsyn said, it was the worst prison in all of history. It was the one in, uh, uh, that he was in and tortured in things that way. But he said it was there that he learned to pray. And he talks about, there's a several good YouTube videos, by the way, Roman Braga, B-R-A-G-A, uh, uh, Google them. Uh, they're, they're in a, a bit of a broken English, but he talks about uh, prayer. Uh, there was a talk he gave at 
uh, the Antiochian Church, St. Ignatius in uh, near Nashville, what's the town? Um, um, well, anyway, St. Ignatius uh, there. And uh, that's a very, very good uh, talk on this. But he talks about just chatting with God all the time uh, as well. And I think that's a very helpful uh, way of doing it. Um, you know, and stopping even in the middle of things um, and, and having that time. One of the things that grows with this, and um, this is important, uh, and it, you know, is there's a sweetness uh, in noetic prayer. There is the sweetness of the presence of God, sweeter than honey, the scriptures say and honey in the comb. Um, and these kinds of things that when we begin to taste them, then we begin to want them. And it becomes much easier to pray. Um, and, uh, and it's okay in your prayer time, by the way, to say, Lord, I don't know a lot about noetic prayer. I would like to know, teach me, teach me. You know, hound him about it. The scripture is quite clear that it's okay to nag God. Um, you know, Jesus, apparently, I don't know, God's not like me. I don't like being nagged, but it, God says nag him. You know, so this is important. Uh, mix it in. I find it important, by the way, when I'm reading, like something hard, um, and get to it, to stop and talk about it with him. Like, Jesus, what is this? What is he talking about? Is that true? Uh, is there something there to know? I mean, and just ask. Uh, if I'm reading a work by a saint, I will talk to him. St. Basil, what do you mean by this? I mean, we have them. They're around. We just don't bother to ask them anything. You know, and saints are all, they'll answer you not necessarily when you expect them to. They may tell you later, like later on that day, we're in the middle of the service and the light bulb comes on. I don't even know how the messaging service works between us and them, but they come through. Um, I mean, it's odd. Whenever I work, I've got an old truck I bought last year. Whenever I work on my truck, that's one of the reasons I bought it, was to work on it. My father was an auto mechanic, I all, who's passed on now, but I always talk to my dad when I'm working on my truck, and I hear from him a lot. And he'll tell me what wrench to pick up. It's the strangest thing, but I believe it's real, and I, uh, it's sweet, you know, uh, it's good. And so these, these need to be part of our lives. Um, so I guess I'd say expand your prayer. Take it into all of these places. God is interested when you're washing dishes. He's interested, interested when you're raising your children. You know, I think he may sometimes be the least interested in us when we're feeling religious. <laughs> That's, we, we get in a mood. You know, and it's oftentimes he can't get through the mood. He's very interested in these other things. Uh, we shouldn't cut him out. So, yeah. May God bless you. Fresh baptism. Oh, that's wonderful stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'm not quite sure whether it was a comment or from Paula. Franklin 10, whatever that's supposed to mean. Is it a question? Yes, or? Franklin, Tennessee. That's where St. Ignatius is. In ah, Franklin, okay. Tennessee. Um, there's a YouTube with Father Roman Braga talking about prayer recorded there in Franklin. I, I highly recommend it. Worth your time. Worth much better than this. <laughs> Sorry, Father. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, there was a, a, another question that just came. Uh, can you elaborate more on the current state of racism issues and how we can engage with each other uh, both in and out of the church? Yeah, I'm really impressed, by the way, uh, or delighted and grateful that the fellowship of St. Moses the Black exists. Um, I was talking to another priest about this uh, 18 or so years ago when the OCA was receiving into it a lot of the congregations from the Christ Our Savior Brotherhood. I remember feeling a little nervous about it because of background and things, and also because uh, I'm an elitist. And, uh, oh yeah, I, my chrism was hardly dry, but I was an elitist. Um, and I had no idea 
idea in time, the gift they were bringing us. They brought a diversity to American orthodoxy that we had not had. Uh, they probably brought more black members uh, into the church than we had in all of North American orthodoxy. Uh, they just did. And great figures like uh, uh, Father uh, Moses out in, uh, uh, Moses Berry out in, in Louisiana and others, I mean, not Louisiana, I mean, in St. Louis, who, who and, and the current dialogue that's going on now, the nun Catherine uh, and others, um, or priests uh, who, like the late uh, Father Jacob, uh, Myers in Atlanta, whose parish very, very uh, diverse and uh, tremendous work among uh, the poor and the homeless there, and he was an amazing man. Um, so, I so for one thing, there's that. So, uh, kind of becoming uh, familiar with that and having those conversations. Um, you know, my parish we have several black members now, uh, and. Uh, uh, with them, we have, I've sometimes had conversations that I haven't had opportunities to have. I mean, first off, people actually have to talk to each other. Um, I, try to, I try to tell my children and grandchildren and anybody else who will listen to me about the honest experience of growing up in the Jim Crow South. It was as racist as the day is long, and people who try to cover it up and say something nice about it don't know what they're talking about. It was awful. It was awful. And we need to talk about that. I, my first experience of racism, uh, I was four years old and I drank from the water fountain Mark Colored in a department store. My mother snatched me up and told me I couldn't drink from that one. That one was for colored people. And she didn't explain to me and we don't drink after them because we're racist. <laughs> she didn't explain it at all. But I went home that day at age four, and the only reason that I could think of that you can't drink after someone is because they're dirty and have germs. And I spent the rest of that day afraid that I was going to turn black, that I had caught it from them. Well, it didn't happen, but uh, it's interesting. Uh, no explanation had to be given. You're age four, but a seed is planted in your mind in which you instinctive, instinctively then, because there's, a, there's, there's shame involved, there's uh, some other very primary neurobiological things that when you tell something, somebody something is dirty, uh, they'll react to it and, and will have to deal with it the rest of their life if they don't come to grips with it. Uh, white people in America oftentimes think black are, blacks are dirty, uh, that they're unclean, that they smell funny, uh, they think this is this was part of our heritage uh, in white racism. We don't talk about it. We don't admit it. Blacks will tell you about white people curious about their hair, wanting to touch it and things that way. I mean, we're just biologically nervous around them. And we've, this is, you don't have to tell these things. Children learn them without ever being told that. Now, now when I was 10 years old and in a Baptist summer camp, I was taught biological racism up front by Bob Jones students. So I, I, I know about that and that was there too. And um, my last Sunday in a Baptist church was when my older brother walked out in protest against a racist sermon that was preaching against the integration of Furman University in Greenville. And, and I became a protester because he was my ride home. Uh, I was 13 and uh, we had a fight on the way home because I was arguing, telling him he was wrong. At the end of that day, he spat in my face. That was the day I stopped. I began to stop being a racist. It was terrible. It makes me weep to think of it. He was right. Um, but it's, you have to deal with these things. You know, we got to tell each other these stories, these honest stories. Don't get caught up in the politics of who's rioting, who's in charge of the rioting. Hell, the Marxists are trying to do all the things, but they'll always do that. They'll take advantage of stuff. There's a heart work for us to do because we're Christians. Don't care about what the government's saying on this stuff. Care about that you and I have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for the state of our heart. And that the state of our heart is keeping me from knowing God in the depth and fullness that he wants to make himself known in me. I would like to see 
every human being the way God sees them, and I don't. I don't. Not yet. But I would like to. And so we just, you know, I said at the beginning of this thing, it's all about knowing God. This stuff gets in the way. And so you deal with it. Forget about the politics. Forget about it. That's out of your con control. Look at your heart. Look at your heart. Um, you know, and, and use the opportunities. Use the opportunities. So um, don't be defensive. Just get over that. Don't be defensive. Uh, it's a waste of time. Um, I try to tell honest stories about myself and, and, and where I came from. I saw tremendous changes, though. Um, tremendous changes. I mean, heck, one of my grandfathers was a member of the Klan. The other one was written down by the Klan. I've seen it's a, it's a messy story. I, th I think about this when I think about Russia and Russians I knew after the fall of the Soviet Union. It, it was interesting. I gathered that for a lot of people, they had someone in the family at some point in time who had been in the camps. And they also had someone in the family at some point in time who had been a member of the party. And so the problem wasn't them, it was us. And, and that's helpful. You know, one of the problems after World War II was, you know, we Americans, we weren't Nazis. And the Jewish thing, the terrible things they did to the Jews, we didn't feel responsible for, despite the fact that we refused to take them in when they tried to come. There are many thousands of Jews who died because of, of the U.S. Uh, before uh, uh, before World War II, we didn't. We don't want to talk about that. That's that's you know, repentance is hard business. Hard business. It is truth is truth is hard. Um, that's that's why we're orthodox. People talk about Orthodox as the Marines of Christianity. Then I said, then for God's sake, start repenting like it. You know, so, you know, this is, this, um, we got a lot of work ahead. Thank God. Um, it, it's, there's nothing else to do in the pandemic anyway. So. <laughs> Stay at home and repent. <laughs> oh. So. Anyone else? Any more questions? People are just listening in a contemplative. Beating them into submission. <laughs> it's good for their souls, right? Well, maybe. Uh, oh my God, he's gone to preaching, you know. <laughs> Sorry. I've heard you so many times. Yeah, well, I... I only say what you taught me, Father. Oh, no, 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 no. You came into my church and taught me everything I know. <laughs> Father, well, and uh, coming back maybe to the original question, how do you bring uh, intellectual interest into the church? And even is it even possible or is it, is it even necessary? Well, I think, you know, um, bring the stuff that tastes really good. Um, you know, uh, good works. I mean, for instance, uh, the little book for the life of the world that Father Alexander Schmemann wrote, there is as much good scholarship in that work as I can think of in anything else. Uh, when you read Father Alexander's journals, you get the idea that everything was this book on the Eucharist he was writing. I fall asleep reading that one. Uh, for the life of the world uh, turns out to have been his important work. And, and that really is just a, you know, it was sort of a collection of some talks he gave almost. But, you know, uh, use it. Uh, I mean, it's a very sweet book, too. And it's a, a book that both that has a lot of intellectual content and a book that has a lot of noetic content. It really has both. And um, I know when I've, when I, my little book on uh, talking about a one story universe was me trying to do my converts riff on. Uh, Oh, Father Alexander's stuff on the sacraments, just trying to put it into attractive contemporary terms so you begin to understand what it means to see the world as sacrament. And, um, but, you know, finding little works like that that are sweet, that are worth having a discussion on, that are readable, 
Um, although I've met people who said they found for the life of the world too hard for them and they liked my book better. And I think, well, that's just because it's easier. And I'm sure there's something better than that. But, you know, these are worth reading, thinking, uh, digging a little bit. Um, you know, uh, I mean, the first thing I read in Orthodox theology was Vladimir Lossky's Mystical Theology of the Eastern Church. A buddy of mine gave it to me in the library in college and said, here, Stevie, you need to read this. <laughs> I read it and I knew it was deep as could be. And I didn't understand most of it, but it became a signpost that pointed towards orthodoxy and said, keep reading this stuff. They know what they're talking about. And, um, you know, I reread it a year or so ago and I thought, gosh, this is really good. Uh, it was way better than I thought it, than I knew it was. Uh, but, you know, and I can read it now. The time's passed and I've learned a lot more. Um, but, um, Little tidbits, little nuggets, good conversations that have a mix of intellect and noetic quality. Um, and I think it's good to have both um, because you want to nurture both. Uh, and uh, because, it, it, frankly, the, the noetic is the sweetness of it. The, the other is, you know, can get dry and you need the sweetness of it. Um, so, yeah. Mother Stephen. This should, all, this should all be so much fun, by the way. This should just be fun. Truly. It's like you talked about, Father, going to seminary. Hungry. And uh, I worked for two years in factories before I started college. And uh, I was living in a commune, but I was working in a factory. I was a Jesus freak. But I went to college, and my classes were over by noon the first day, and I had nothing to do the rest of the day but read books. And I remember laying in the grass on a beautiful September day, the sun down, I was there in Greenville Furman, and I thought, my God, I don't have to do anything today but read books. This is really great. And it was a whole lot better than any factory I'd ever worked in. And I worked at trying to keep that attitude for the rest of college as that for four years, they're going to let me get away with this. And, uh, you know, at some point, I'm going to have to go back to work. This is great. This is great. Writing a paper. Somebody's going to read me. Um, I remember the day I did uh, defended my thesis at Duke. And I had Jeffrey Wainwright, Stanley Harawas, uh, and Susan O'Keefe, a historian. The three of them were on my committee. And I remember going in and thinking, I'm going to spend two or three hours today with these world-renowned figures who are only going to talk about what I think. How cool is that? I mean, that's just, you know, I'm a little scared because you've got to defend your thesis. But on the other hand, the top, today's topic is what I think. Um, and, you know, and they're going to listen and they'll ask me questions. You know, that's, how is that not fun? Uh, it should be fun. Um, you know, it's so sweet. Next question. Father, do you have any thoughts on the news and the creative mind, how they interact? Um, I, you know, I'm not certain that the news is, uh, it's a good question, it's a very good question. I'm not certain that I know the answer to it. Um, the, the creative thing that happens can have a real perception about it. So it does have something about it that can be noetic. I mean, um, when someone sees something, I mean, for instance, when you're the creative act of, of painting, you use art. Um, the perception of beauty, by the way, is a noetic activity. Uh, it can be a very deep noetic activity. It can be a gateway to God, uh, even. Um, when I talk with atheists, I try to change the subject from God to beauty. Um, if I can get an atheist to start talking to me about their experience of beauty, if I can finally get them to just discuss the beautiful and get to the how their heart is with beauty, then I will say to them, what you want or see when you perceive beauty is much closer to what we Orthodox mean when we say God than what you think about when you say God. That's much closer to what we mean. 
So in that sense, you know, an artist who is trying to paint beauty, who, who is pursuing beauty, for that matter, a poet who's pursuing beauty, um, is there's a noetic part of that. And so I would say, uh, I would even encourage people need to read more poetry than they do. Uh, St. Porphyrius said, uh, in order to become a Christian, you need to first become a poet. Um, it's, you know, we, sh we don't spend much time doing that. Our culture is very, very, it's not just secular, it's very prosaic. It's just the facts, ma'am. We read too many facts. You need more poetry. Uh, you, we need more beauty. Um, that's why we, the church is filled with icons. It's filled with beauty. We're ex helping our children experience beauty, trying to make it normative. We sing poetry the whole time. And I think one of the things we miss in our English uh, language services is that the Greek services, for that matter, the Slavonic, which is very, tries to be faithful to the Greek, are much more poetic. I mean, you say the, the you know, the, the Akathis, but you miss the entire poetry. Half the, all these plays on word, on words that are in it, the things like this amazing feast, poetic feast, and you don't hear it in English so much. We don't do that. Um, we don't, do, there's not enough poetry in our English services, um, but that's another thing, but we need to, um, so the answer is it's very close. It's very much a part of it. Um, and it should be nurtured. Uh, uh, poetry, art, music. Uh, it's good, by the way, to sing some when you pray. Because uh, music, music kind of bypasses intellect. Uh, music is, uh, can be deeply noetic. You know, the first thing I read about orthodoxy, as I said, was Vladimir Lasky, but that's not what got me. Uh, around the same time or a year later, my wife, we got married when I was in college. We were home one night and uh, NPR was playing on the radio and suddenly I'm hearing this music. I'd never heard anything like that before, but I thought, I don't know what this is. We stayed transfixed to the radio waiting for it to finish. It was in Russian. Transfixed to the radio waiting for it to finish to be sure that I didn't miss what it was so that I could buy the record of it. I just, I thought, I don't know what this is, but this must be what they sing at the throne of God. We sat listening. It was uh, Rachmaninoff's Vespers. It was the first time I had heard Rachmaninoff's Vespers. And in 1976, that would have been, uh, it was not a very commonly performed piece. It was fairly rare. The only recording you could get was on the Melodia label, performance by the uh, National Chorus of USSR. Sveshnikov uh, directed brilliant performance. I still don't think I've heard another one as good, but uh, I heard that and, you know, and uh, I heard orthodoxy. That spoke to my heart. I heard orthodoxy. Um, and uh, our services, if at all possible, should be beautiful. If at all possible. I mean, if it's possible, you know, just you do what you can. Uh, if you're you're in a storefront mission and you got three bad voices, well, you do the best you can. Um, but we should make it's it's not a waste of time. It's well spent time. Well spent time. So, you may have artists and poets in your church. By the way, uh, we have some. We've got a black poet in my church whose poetry just blows me out of the water. Um, and he's published. He's a good, a very good poet teaches English in a local college. Uh, you know, give these people some time, share their talents. Uh, you know, this is important stuff. Um, so, and it's noetic, so long bit on that, but it is, it's there. Um, you know. uh, uh, just a remark, uh, this past uh, uh, Thursday, I had a, it's a metallurgist, a, a professor of Semitic languages, who have, uh, uh, he's a priest, an Orthodox priest, and he taught at Moscow Theological Academy. He attempted to offer his translations of the Psalms, adapting them to more modern Russian poetry without changing the meaning, so, but being very particular. And it's something that truly gives you goosebumps 
you know, yes. no matter what you hear. And because he's, uh, you know, culturologist, so he knows the context, you know, he tries to, uh, he said, any poetry, any writing represents the historical era as to where they're writing. Eternal truth and art that still have, bears this meaning. So when you're translating, you could not just do word for word, but you have to understand the context not to compromise the truth that is in it but to listening to his presentation and to hearing some of his translation literally was just outwardly experience. That's wonderful. I recently reread uh, C.S. Lewis's book, uh, The Discarded Image, that was sort of one of his few just academic works in his field, talking about medieval literature. And he was talking about the medieval worldview, which would actually have been pretty common among the fathers, that is, the world as a series of shells, of, of worlds, in, of, of spheres, uh, in Aristotle's language, these, these series of spheres. And, um, you know, he, he goes into it, and if you will, it's, you know, we, we cannot think in spheres because you cannot get our kind of universe pictures out of our head. That's, we've, we've seen the pictures, we now know how all that works, but uh, you can poetically go back and stand in that place and poetically see these things. The, the noose, interestingly, doesn't worry as much about facts, doesn't worry so much about a lot of these things. And uh, it can move between fact and symbol just seamlessly because, the, frankly, the noose sees facts much, much more like symbols than like facts. Facts are the range, sort of the realm of the intellect. Uh, symbols uh, and levels of meaning and things meaning five things at the same time. This is the realm of the noose. You know, the fathers loved it because they were noetic poets. They, will, they play with language, they play with words. I mean, half the tropars we have have puns in them. They love puns, it was as bad as the British. They're constantly making puns on the name of the saint and stuff that way. My name's Stephen, St. Staphanos means a crown. And so you'll sing the trope art of St. Stephen and they'll mention the crown, of course, and pun, it's a pun on his name and on we go. I mean, so, um, but the noose is happy with that. It, it sees these things, this connectedness of things. It's, so I think that's uh, part of its beauty and, and, uh, and all. Uh, the Psalms. I've done, I've read a lot of, uh, of Don Sheehan's work, uh, Donald Sheehan, his work on the Psalms, his English translation, which is quite good. And I've, uh, I've just written a forward for hopefully a new book that his wife, uh, of course he's died now and his wife Xenia uh, is editing books, but I wrote a forward for a possible new book of his beautiful, beautiful work. And he really combines scholarship and heart uh, very well. I, I certainly recommend his stuff. Uh, it'll make you chew on it. So, yeah. thank you, Father. Next question, if I may. What can uh, we perceive when one hears name a problem, global warming, environmental damage from uh, exploitation of the world resources to the detriment of freshwater resources, the use of world solely for profit? If such and such is a problem, God will fix it. Even Christ did not tempt God. When we know that in pursuit of profit would damage others. This is what? Cutting off the top of the mountains to mine coal and dumping the waste into the valley because it's easy, but destroys poisoning the groundwater. Is this something that God will fix? Um, well, the phrase, if it's a problem, God will fix it, for me would be taking something that similar to what I've said and using it out of context. The, um, it doesn't mean that we don't do things. Like when I rage against the notion of creating a better world, that doesn't mean we don't do good. Uh, the question is we should do good uh, and I don't know how everything adds up. I'm not trying to manage uh, the world, but we should do good. Uh, is controlling pollution good? You're darn right. Uh, is cutting the mountain top off and dumping it in the valley and poisoning the stream bad? You're darn right. So we don't do that. Uh, do I vote against it? Absolutely. Um, do I work with it? Uh, yes. I mean, you know, it's like you do what you can do. On the other hand, if you become uh, 
if you become frozen in a political mode in which all of this becomes, it consumes you and you do not trust in the providence of God, you will in the long run need to blow the world up. Um, I, it's Stanley Hauerwas at Duke, whom I quote a lot because I studied under him, but I think, and he's not orthodox, but he's certainly well worth quoting. Um, he, he once said that, um, that, that in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, God has determined the outcome of history. In other words, the, the end of history is found in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So how all of this turns out, well, no matter what we do, good or bad, it will turn out to be the death and resurrection of Christ. So in that sense, as Christians, we know how the world ends, uh, that it ends up in the providence of God. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't have to give an account for the evil we've done in that. But he says, uh, and I think importantly, uh, that as soon as a Christian agrees to take charge of the outcome of history, he has agreed to do violence. And that is something he says we should not agree to do. And uh, we get panicked about these things. We stop trusting in God and we begin to feel that it's all up to us. That's the secular idea that in fact, it is all up to us. And so then we wind up doing violence. There's some who are desperate, for instance, these days in the streets, they're desperate for a particular outcome of history. And because of their desperation for the outcome of history, they're willing to do violence, to kill a few of this, that, and the other. Uh, as well as there's others on the other side who are very concerned about the outcome of history and therefore they need to do violence. And like Gandhi said, an eye for an eye and the whole world's blind. It, it, it just doesn't pan out that way. We need to be about doing good, you know, and the good is made known to us in the commandments of Christ. We need to go about doing good. We need to pass good laws. We need to live according to good laws, but uh, we then have to put all of it in the hand of God, uh, because if we don't, we wind up becoming demons, uh, and that we don't want to do. And so it's it's uh, it's it's kind of like living life, living life rightly. And so it's not exactly an either or. Yes, we do what we do. I mean, it is. Um, but then, but you have to live with it in the hands of God. And to put things in the hands of God doesn't mean you do nothing, but, but you do the good you're given to do. Um, like I say, people out there are all crazy and worried about politics, but they never actually do anything political. They never, other than vote and make noise on Facebook, but they never go to a city council meeting. They never attend a committee meeting. I mean, they never attended a precinct meeting. They never did anything in the system except have opinions. You know, that's silly. And, and they get angry based on their opinions. You know, when they never did a single thing, they never lifted a finger other than to type a comment on Facebook. They never did a real thing. You know, you're going to do a real thing, love your neighbor. Get real practical about it. So I say, share your stuff. Lots of it. Share your stuff. You're worried about capitalism? Don't be so greedy. You know, do, this is, um, we, our comments and our arguments are so global and we refuse to live locally. Live locally, that's where you sin. <laughs> so live locally, repent locally, love your neighbor, love your rivers, love your trees, um, you know, do these things. I, I mean, I live in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. We've done a lot of nuclear stuff here. Uh, we also are one of the most environmentally active uh, cities in America. Um, you know, my teenage daughter, uh, my baby daughter served on an environmental committee when she was in high school. That, that was, they had to go to city council meetings and stuff and talk about it. And, um, you know, it gave her a heart for these things. Uh, she was involved. Uh, I've tried to be, in, you know, it's great if you live in a small town, you really can be involved, you know. Um, but do that. So it, it, it is still God's problem uh, and he will fix it. And you may not like it when he does. Uh, he's going to resurrect the rivers and we ought to be nice to the rivers, um, you know, the trees and everything else. 
you know, do good, but don't kill people. Don't blow things up. Don't, don't hate them either, you know? I mean, some idiot out there who's poisoning the earth and you hate them. Jesus was nailed to the cross and he said very kind things about those who nailed him, as in they don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. And we have to do the same too. Some are crucifying the earth and we have to forgive them as well and try to pull the nails out, so. Uh, Father, uh, one more question. I have found that those who come into orthodoxy are intense and tend toward intellectualism, read their way in. I am seeing a second wave, maybe, and have to adjust my volume, so to speak. Have you found this to be true? Uh, I've seen a lot of different waves. It's very interesting. You know, someone asked me, I mean, I mean uh, converts are the bread and butter in the missionary South. And, uh, you know, about 25% of our congregation is ethnic Orthodox from Europe and Russia. Uh, the other 75% in our parish are converts. And they come from every kind of background. And someone asked me, what do you do for evangelism? I said, well, I answer my phone. But Nowadays, I would say I, I respond to my emails, uh, although it's the, the rector now since I'm retired. Um, and it's a very thing. Some of them come in very intellectual. Uh, some of them come in, uh, I mean, we've got high, you know, people with just a high school education, blue collar people who don't read a lot, but uh, fell in love with it. My mother and father became Orthodox at age 79. My father, both 11th grade education. My father was an auto mechanic. My mother worked in a in a mill, um, and they took to orthodoxy like ducks to water. Um, third Sunday of, of uh, Lent, my father's first year of orthodoxy, he called me up on the phone. He said, Stephen, I, they brought the cross out today. He said, I, I wanted to get down. <laughs> he said, but they had to get me back up. <laughs> he, I mean, but, you know, he'd grown up as a Baptist Protestant, uh, but the idea of, of getting on his knees before the cross, he understood it from the heart. It's complete, he didn't even have a question about it. Of course you want to kneel before the cross, uh, but they had to get him back up. It, it was not intellectual, uh, but it suited him. And orthodoxy can, can run the whole, the whole gamut of it. And so essentially I would say is that whatever comes through the door, that's what God has sent. God sent them. They didn't come. They came because God brought them. And so whatever God has brought, that's what we deal with. You know, and it's, uh, and, and it, it runs, it runs the whole thing. And Paul says, uh, writing Timothy, be instant in season and out of season. You know, to the Jew, I became a Jew. To the Gentile, I became a Gentile. I would say to the intellectual, I become an intellectual. You know, to the peasant, I become a peasant. To be all things to all men, Paul says, so that if by any means, I might save some. I feel particularly blessed because I grew up a blue collar child in a blue collar world. And then, you know, uh, became Episcopalian and spent 20 years trying to pass for white. And uh, sorry, nothing's more waspy than an Episcopalian. And, uh, you know, I was actually a redneck, not white, but a redneck. And, you know, you had to learn that, you know, go through all of this training and education so I can, I can swing all the way with it, uh, you know, and I'm glad to do it. I, I, love, I love my mountain people here in Appalachia, and I love my educated people too, all of them. Whatever comes to the door, you know, God has sent them. And orthodoxy, thank God, is well suited to all of them because orthodoxy is the fullness of what it means to be human. And whatever it means to be human, it fits in the Orthodox world, whatever it is. And if it doesn't feel like it fits right to you, then you need to change. It all fits. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, I, I, I love it. I'm in a little crossroads here uh, in Oak Ridge between both worlds. Uh, nuclear physicist, computer specialist, the world's fastest computer was here in Oak Ridge. Uh, you know, all this cool stuff. And, uh, and we've got coal miners uh, and uh, work coal miners these days. But uh, 
meth heads, poorest of the poor, you know, rednecks. I love them. My people. <laughs> yeah. So this has been great, Father Ilya. Um, Thank you, Father. You, you gather nice crowds. Well, it's only your name. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, glad to help them. Thank but, you. Thank you, Father. Well, we shall do, we shall repeat. We shall good. repeat. <laughs> with, your, with your kind agreement, we shall repeat, hopefully. Maybe we do an Orthodox cooking show. <laughs> Orthodox cooking show. No, there are too many of those. <laughs> Frankly, I never knew this. Coming, coming from overseas, you do not yeah. also associate a particular way of cooking with the faith. You know, nobody would ask how you celebrate Pascha all by dying eggs or anything. It's just not the thing. No, no, not that we don't do it. And I'm saying yeah. not that a sense of superiority. That's the difference it, between Russia and Romania. <laughs> don't you just don't associate with it. I mean, you do things, but it's you know, not 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 something that is a mainstream. You know, of course, there is not any 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 less superficiality to the things most important, but still, nevertheless. So I'm thinking I'm done with ethnic cooking and with um, food celebrations of the church, of the church feasts. But nevertheless, uh, we shall continue. Thank you very much for coming. If any of our listeners would be interested, uh, next Saturday we'll have a very nice presentation by a very unusual guest who is uh, a, a Protestant pastor in Turkey, in Istanbul, uh, wow. head of a very active Turkish Christian. Uh, congregation and he's a good friend of mine and he is an awesome Byzantinist and history buff and he will give a virtual tour of Istanbul Archaeology Museum wow. talking about biblical antiquities as you know Ottoman Empire at the time of great archaeological discoveries was in charge of all the biblical sites so Istanbul Museum of Archaeology is a treasure trove of various biblical antiquities and he have a very nice way to put them into context, talking not only about weights, but those uh, Sumerian writings and e Egyptian sarcophagi and Jewish calendars and God knows what else. Wow. So uh, it's going to be in a week, um, also at one o'clock. An announcement about this posted uh, on my Facebook page. And thereafter, we're going to have also interesting guests uh, every Saturday, one at a time. Uh, talking about some uh, mosaic of different topics, but still nevertheless doing, doing with Christian history, art, living, engagement with the world and such. Very good. Well, I'll turn, you know, if I may ask to read a prayer so we can conclude our meeting. And I thank you for doing a wonderful presentation, answering our questions and all the guests for participating. And until I'll see you all next time. Very good. Father, you it want me to true. pray? Yes, please. Go ahead. Your friend. Oh, okay. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, O oh, Christ God, I pray your grace to be with all of us who've been here together today. Um, we pray that you scatter uh, the virus and lift it from us, but we give you thanks that we're still able to gather in such ways and your care and concern for us. Protect us, nurture our intellect, uh, cleanse the noose, heal our hearts, and grant us your great grace of salvation. Yes, we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, everybody. Very good. Till we'll see each other again. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.